based on that, points of information are a strategic tool. They are not a tool for content, they are not a tool for furthering your argumentation, they are a tool for developing your strategy, your tactics. Okay? They are a tactical weapon. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> points of information function as something that is not specified in the debate itself. So they are the one thing that no one can predict, okay? And that's important. Uh, because everyone knows the order in which the speeches are going to go, nobody knows the order in which points of information are going to be asked. Right? So the decisions that you make about points of information are inherently strategic decisions and they should be treated as such. Okay? Now we're going to talk a bit about strategy later on, about specific strategic uses for points of information, but it should be remembered that they are a strategic tool. That the same way that you won't be able to win a debate, you won't be able to make an argument in a point of information, you don't have enough time and the person speaking isn't going to let you, and you probably won't be able to engage in a full-on rebuttal of an argument that the other side is having in a point of information. So, yes. They're not a content tool, and you need to be aware of that, okay? So these two things in the beginning are very important, because they frame points of information in terms of what they actually can do, right? So stop expecting too much from points of information, and stop forcing yourself to do everything in a 10 second long point of information. Now, lesson number three, which is very, very, very important. Write your points of information down. Every single point of information that you ask should be written down for a variety of reason. reasons. The first one being what happened to me yesterday. And I'm still amazed. I never expected anything like that would happen. Um, because moments like these aren't that uncommon. Right? So it wasn't the first time I was confused when somebody called on me for a point of information. And it doesn't take much for that to happen to you, right? So yesterday we had the point of information ready, I read it, I stood up, I was listening to Tuna. For about 10 seconds I zoned out thinking about something on his t-shirt. I just stopped paying attention. Tuna saw that on my face, called on me, and I drew a blank. Right? And the problem was that the point of information was written on the other side of the paper that was on my desk. Right? So the only thing I needed to do was this and read it out loud. Or if I wasn't stupid, I would have it open all the time. Right? And it, it probably won't happen to you that you won't have a point of information, because that truly was an extreme situation. But what will happen to you is you're going to have a two second uh, span of drawing a blank, so you'd be going, uh, uh, uh and then ask something stupid and unimportant just so you don't look like a moron for having to stand up and not asking a point of information, right? I would even say then that in those situations it's better just to sit down than to ask a stupid question, but it, that's something that you guys have to decide on your own, and obviously it's very easy for me to say now that something like that has happened to me, right? But writing points of information down is important from that perspective. Okay? Because it, it doesn't need to be the end of the world for something like this to happen to you. All it takes is one wrong moment, you thinking about your shoes and somebody saying go, and I guarantee you, you won't be able to remember that point of information. So you should have it written down. The other reason why you should write points of information down is that so you can discuss them with your teammate. Now yesterday, I don't know if you've noticed, me and Tito were constantly discussing points of information. So we started off with two points of information written, points of information written down. Uh, one was the one about the sovereignty, the second one was the one about Nelson Mandela. Uh, we then decided that the Nelson Mandela one was more appropriate at that moment. We asked it, when we were both standing up, we both knew what our point of information was. It was completely irrelevant who they chose. Okay? And I think that's important. I think that's important because it makes sure that your strategic team line stays the same. Right? Even if you think that you're the smarter one in the team, your whole team should know what the point of information is because sometimes
stuff's going to happen where you're going to get speakers who just aren't going to give you a point of information, right? For whatever reason, because they're afraid of you, because they hate you, because they're secretly in love with you, it doesn't really matter, right? But sometimes people won't give you a point of information, and somebody else will have to ask it, and you should be prepared for that. Moving on, you should all work on your points of information together because you only have 15 seconds. When you only have 15 seconds or less, and usually as far as judges are concerned, when judges are going to decide that you've now gone overtime, it usually flips at the 10-11 second mark because judges do that by feeling, and 10 seconds is a long time in a debate. You should cut out all the words that you don't need from your point of information. You should ask your teammates to help you phrase that point of information. What exactly is it that you're trying to ask, right? Because for instance, and I'm, 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 in a way I was very sad and then it was my mistake for not abusing that, or using that in my speech. Yesterday when I asked the point of information, when can national sovereignty be violated? I didn't get an answer, right? Because I think that that was a problem in their case. Uh, although, I admit, I didn't exploit it uh, to the fullest extent. Um, but here's the thing, right? So the point of information that I asked was the following. So the point of information was, when can the national sovereignty be violated? And this wasn't the first version of the point of information, by far, okay? So the first version of this point of information was, what is national sovereignty? The second version was, can we break national sovereignty, can we violate national sovereignty and when? And only then did this point of information become, when can national sovereignty be violated? Right? We'll talk about how to phrase your points of information a, bit, a little bit later, but just to show you that points of information do have their own evolution and usually evolve into much better points of information, into much more offensive, but offensive is the wrong word here, because it means that you've said something very bad to someone, but into more direct points of information. Right? So if I was to ask, what is national sovereignty, whatever the answer was, that wouldn't help my case. It would give me something and would nudge an argument into the debate, but at the end of the day, it would have done nothing for me. If I would have asked, what is national sovereignty and when can it be violated, the second question would have been ignored, and secondly, I don't even have the right to ask two different points of information in one in a debate. Framing the question in, when can national sovereignty be violated, I think it's extremely efficient because it already assumes that national sovereignty is a thing. Right? I think that in the case of national sovereignty that can be done because no one in the debate is going to deny its existence. Right? So I can assume that. And as soon as I assume that, I assume the second thing, which means that we do violate national sovereignty, which nobody in the debate is going to dispute because of the positions that we're on. So the only thing that I need to ask now is when can national sovereignty be violated? Now, the reason I'm asking when can national sovereignty be violated is because I want the opposition to give me a metric that they think is okay of violating national sovereignty. Right? And their response in that moment was, we refuse to give you that metric because this is a hard question, which is exactly the effect that you're looking for. Right? But we'll get to phrasing of points of information a bit later, what is important for now is that you should write your points of information down. Okay? You should write your points of information down for the reason that we just went through. So number one, not to forget it. Number two, to share it with your teammate. And number three, to make it better. Okay? So you should have a single piece of paper, write your point of information down, show it to the other two people on the team, let them fix it, edit it, cross words out, change the questions, flip it around, whatever it is that you need to do. Trust me, it matters a lot, okay? If nothing else, it brings you more confidence as you're standing up and somebody says, go, and you go, <gasps> and you just read the question off the paper, okay? So that's important. 
Now, we've covered the pieces of advice that are most easily applied. Now, there's one more thing that I'd like to give you that is a general piece of advice, which is something that I, I'd like to say figure it out, but at the end of the day I'm still not sure if it's true, um, about a year ago. So here's the thing, when I work with people who debate, one of the things that I hate working with them the most is working on points of information. The reason I hate it is because it's very hard to structure any kind of exercise for people being able to practice points of information and then at the same time being able to give relevant feedback to them because you either have 30 second speeches with a point of information after which you cut everyone off or you've got a bunch of points of information and you're unable to give feedback to everyone on each and every point of information. And that was problematic. After which. I started thinking about what was the problem, right? Because as I was looking at people, at beginners and debating, they all seemed to make the same mistake. I didn't quite realize what that mistake was, right? So something was wrong about their points of information. Something could have been much better, but I didn't quite know why. Now, I think I have the solution. I think I have the answer to that. Um, However, that answer isn't as actionable as telling you guys write your points of information down. So it will require a bit of effort on your part, but I think that it will show tremendous results. At least it did when I told random people that and watched them debate again. Now here's the thing. When you're prepping for 15 minutes on emotion, you are going to, if you want or not, <coughs> construct your own language that you're going to be using in that debate, which is going to be informed by the thing that you know, it's going to be informed by the position you're on, it's going to be informed by the assumptions that you have of what the other teams are going to be doing, but there are going to be at the end of the day certain words that you're going to use to describe certain things in that debate, and those words are going to be obvious to you. Right? And of course it goes much deeper than that, but this isn't a language class, so I don't think there's a need for many technicalities. Now, you then ask a point of information. So you have your speeches which happen in this language and that's the framing battle that happens in every debate. But you ask points of information of antagonistically, right? So we stand up and try to prove the, to the other person in 10 seconds that they're stupid. And of course we fail, but that is the general, I don't know, emotion that we have when we're asking points of information. And we forget that we are using the same language that we've been using in our speech and in our prep time, which is language specific to us. Now, the person speaking is using their own language and their own view of what this debate should be. Um, and they're talking in a completely different registry. Now, you are going to ask your point of information, jump into their speech for 15 seconds with something completely out of the blue, with a completely different language, and most of the time, nobody is going to understand you. Okay? So even if people are going to understand the words, they are not going to understand the question, or even if they are going to understand the question, it is going to give them a tremendous opportunity to dodge that question. Okay? Simply because of the differences in language. And that is problematic, right? So what do you do at that moment? Now, I think that the, the thing that's problematic is the way we approach points of information, right? So exactly their antagonistic nature. So the fact that we say, or at least think in our heads, that points of information are the moment in the debate where we show to the other person that they've just said something dumb, or that they themselves are dumb. And I think that's wrong. I don't think that's wrong for some weird hippie reason that you should all continue to love yourself. Right? I think love is suspended during debate. I was extremely mean to some of my very good friends yesterday. I think that's okay. Um, what I do think that you guys should do is the following. I think you should phrase your points of information or construct your points of information in such a way that their goal is to help the speaker currently speaking understand why they are wrong. And 
this is very important. The way I'm phrasing this is very important. The point of your points of information, so the reason of their existence, the way you should construct them, the goals with which you should make them, should be that the person speaking right now, so the person that you're asking this point of information, should realize or figure out why they're wrong. Now, why is this so different and why is this important? I think it's different and it's important because it comes from a completely different position. Alright, so you're not speaking from a position where you are the one who knows what's going on and everyone else doesn't and therefore you get to make fun and use your own language and nobody else will understand you. But it comes from a position where you're actively trying to help the person speaking understand why they are wrong. Which means that you're going to have to instinctively even, without thinking, adapt to their own language, use their own language, which is also the language the judge is thinking right now, okay? Because they've been listening to that person for the last three minutes. And if you're, if you're, fra if you're framing the, your points of information in that way, it's going to ensure that much more people are going to understand you, it's going to ensure that points of information are much more to the point, okay? So I want you to actively help that person to understand why they are wrong, okay? And it should be an honest help, right? Otherwise, I'd say in debates, you should never try to convince the other team because by definition, they will disagree with you. Points of information for me here are an exception and I think that what you... And I think that what you should do is actively try and make the other person understand why they are wrong in your point of information, okay? So that is the last general piece of advice that I have for you. Um, we are now... We are now going to go into some specific things that you guys can do as far as points of information are concerned. Sorry. Before we do that, are there any questions? No, everything clear. Absolutely everything is clear. Wow. Good job, me. Okay, now, moving on. Discussing first the way we ask points of information, right? So the phrasing of these points of information. Because we've already started with this idea that you should help the other person understand. Now, what are different types or ways of asking points of information. What would you guys say? Boys and girls? Sir. Sir? Sir, miss. Come again. Sir, miss. Sir, miss. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so not how, not how you ask a point of information, so how you ask for a point of information, how you actually deliver a point of information. So when someone says, yes, go. As a question, or... Okay, Oof. give me something more. Potentially, uh, potentially like this, or in a way that you show they're wrong. So here's what I want to get to. I want to get to different categories in your head as to how points of information function. Right? Because all of you have some kind of an idea of different types of points of information. What are those? What are the different ways in which you can make a point of information? Just start talking. Yeah? You can maybe make a yes or no question, or maybe when you uh, um, want a description or something. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Sorry? Mm, some, any sort of clarification. Oh, okay. You could ask why or how if you want the, the, uh, the team against you to explain the what. Okay.
Like you ask some question, right? And you ask them to evaluate. And it's all like the, the whole point of the question is for them to be exposed to somewhere. If they're, if they're, basically, it depends on what they say about how they're going to be exposed, right? But this is passive on your part. Active is like when you're trying to like push some kind of idea. So what you're saying is that when you're asking a question, you're not trying to push an idea. And you always are, but like in the actual way that you formulate it. Okay. So I think that, to be honest, I think that distinction is useless. In the sense that if you think about points of information in that way, in the long run, it doesn't bring you anything. Right? So I think, yes, okay. it's, really. it's correct in the sense that you can differentiate questions in such a way. I just think it's useless in terms of strategic decision making. Right? So as a debater, I would never have asked myself those questions or that type of categorization. Okay, so we've got some ideas. Anything else? Yeah? Stuff that's about their case and stuff that's about your case. Possibly. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things that I don't want you do in points of information because I think that those are bad practices. Now, number one is asking yes no questions. I don't I don't think that's a good idea. Most people will agree. Um, especially because the other person can just answer with a yes or no. So luckily that didn't happen yesterday, but I think it's perfectly legitimate. Uh oh, maybe it was true that he likes to ask <laughs> points of information like that sometime when you go La 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 la, wouldn't you agree? And then the person says yes or no. Or even if it is a question that is generally phrased as a yes or no question, I don't think that's always a good idea. Because again, the answer could be a simple yes or no. Now, if you're trying to set up a trap by asking a yes or no question, I think that's also problematic because most people will figure out that it's a trap and somehow avoid. The, the question. Right? So asking binary questions in points of information, I think strategically it doesn't make sense. I think in some cases, yes, it could be useful. However, most of the time, I don't think that it makes sense to be trying to do that. Now, those are yes, no questions. Secondly, there's the second type of questions in which you try and <coughs> somehow uh, preview your own material. Which I think is an interesting phenomenon that, that's been observed in debating, right? So second, so teams are trying to somehow ask a point of information that's going to preview their own material, right? So that, that, that's going to show what kind of arguments they are going to be making. Now, I think that is strategically dubious, not in the sense that it won't work, but that the decision itself that you want to preview your own material is weird. If you ask me, unless of course you're in BP, but even there, it's very very awkward. Um, however, I do think there's a couple of things that we need to recognize here. Number one, this is always going to be happening, right? So you're always going to be previewing your own material. Now, I don't think in that sense that if you want to do this, it's a good move to to frame or form a point of information in a way that will allow you to preview to display your own material. <coughs> I would instead like you to ask a point of information which is going to give you material that you can then use or abuse in your speech. Okay? So I think that that switch is very important. So in that sense, even though I wanted to talk about national sovereignty, sovereignty, sorry, um, in my speech yesterday, the point of information that I asked wasn't a display of our own material. Its purpose wasn't to show that we are going to talk about national sovereignty. Its purpose was for me to get an answer onto which I can latch on and then whip the opposition with. Okay, That was the only single point of that question. Now the fact that it related to my own case I think was great. But other than that, I don't think that you should actively try and waste points of information to display your own material or to show what's actually going to happen. I think that's wrong. Now, moving on from that, I think that setting up traps is a particularly interesting idea that shows up in the way we think about points of information. 
However, I think it's a problematic idea, right? Because nobody knows exactly how to set up a trap, how do these work. Most of the time, debaters are going to figure out it's a trap and somehow get out of it. It has now become worse because people assume it's a trap all the time. Um, so I think that the way people decide whether or not it's a trap is based on the fact whether or not they have an answer ready for it. Okay? I think that's very important. I think that's one of the things that are more pure gold if you know how to use it. So the problem with when can sovereignty be broken from yesterday's debate was the fact that the speaker didn't have an answer to that. She had absolutely no clue how to answer that question because she isn't a student of international relations. She doesn't particularly care about national sovereignty in her day-to-day -day life. So she didn't have an answer ready, which in a way was good, was fine with me. Um, but because of that reason, I think she immediately decided it was a trap and ran away from that question. So I think that there's one, one very important thing that you're going to need to do when asking tons of information which want to be traps. Number one, check at least twice whether or not your trap makes sense. Check at least twice whether or not your trap makes sense. Oftentimes, people are going, you, yourselves, are going to see a glitch in someone else's speech and then decide to exploit that where at the end of the day it doesn't really matter. Okay? So check twice if it's something worth pursuing. Don't just go after every inconsistency that they have in a case. All right? Obviously I'm biased here, uh, but the point at which Tuna, after my speech yesterday, talks about uh, a contradiction that I apparently entered into by saying that this is only metadata and then after that that we don't exactly know what's going on, right? I think that that wasn't a contradiction that made my case explode. I don't think it was a contradiction at all. I think it was the linear use of language, right? But I understand Tuna's move. I understand the motivation behind it and I think in a way it was a good move. I just don't think that on paper it would hold. And I think that the problem isn't you consciously making moves like this. And dunking other people into inconsistencies and contradictions. I think that oftentimes when you're panicking, when the debate is happening, we often latch onto the first thing that we can and then try to exploit that. So whenever you're going to be setting a trap, check twice whether or not it's actually a trap and whether or not it's actually a useful trap before you set it. Secondly, you want to try and ask the question in such a way that the person speaking is going to feel as if that question has been asked wrongly. So the best way that you can ensure to get an answer to your point of information is to make the speaker believe that you messed up. Right? There are several different ways in which to do this, that doesn't mean you have to stutter, but it means that you should ask points of information in a way that, on the first hand, probably aren't directly relevant to your own case. Does that make sense? So framing the question in such a way that the link to your case is not immediately seen. I don't think any of those points of information happened in yesterday's debate. Sorry. In yesterday's debate, I think they should have. However, I think that when you are going to be asking points of information that are going to try to be traps, I think it's extremely, 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 extremely beneficial if you try and phrase them in such a way that they don't really have a connection to your case. Okay? At least not in the first uh, moment someone hears them. Are there any questions regarding these? Yes. It might sound an issue, but how can you, like, I don't understand, I'm trying to listen to the person's point, so at the same time, am I supposed to be kind of concentrating harsh and phrase my points of information in such a strategic way? You write them down and let other people help you. Okay. I, I genuinely think that's the answer. I'm not trying to avoid it, right? I think that, so here's the thing. There are, Number one, you can only think in language. Number two, written and spoken language are substantially different. 
right? So when you have a problem talking to yourself about two different things, so talking to yourself about the speech that's actually going on and talking to yourself about the point of information that you need to ask, I think you can solve that by talking to yourself about the speech in your mind and writing to yourself on that point of information, right? So there are different modes of thought, not only of communication, writing and speaking. And I think you should use it to utilize that. So whenever you're missing multitasking capacity in a debate, start writing the second thing down and still continue thinking about the first thing and most of the time you should be fine. I hope that helps. Right? But secondly, you, you truly should involve the other people on your team into this process. Right? I think it helps tremendously to have other people look at your points of information. And not only your points of information in the sense that you, as a singular person, have created them, but your points of information as the points of information of the whole team. Okay. Yep. Yeah. When you start improving your point of information and discussing with your teammates mm -hmm. and your point of information becomes relevant to the debate because debaters are already talking about something else. Okay, so here's the thing. Points of information, <coughs> how, uh, how do we define relevance of points of information? It's not about what the person is speaking at that exact moment. You're not only allowed to ask questions about what's going on at that exact second. There is no rule prohibiting you from asking about something that the person was speaking two minutes ago. I agree that in a way, as far as flow is concerned, it's better to be asking points of information that are concerned with the moment that's happening there and then, but I think it's completely legitimate, and I've done it at least a hundred times, or even more, to ask a point of information, or to ask a point of information saying, ah, a minute ago you were talking about this, this was wrong because of blah, and you're done, and it's a point of information that's asked, okay? Do you think that in that sense, that isn't going to be a method of how relevant your point of information is? What is going to determine the relevance of your point of information is the way you or your teammates are going to use it in your speech. Okay? And I think that's very important. So let's spend a couple of minutes on that, even though I wanted to get to that a bit later. Um, you should use your points of information in your speech. That is the only thing that's going to make them relevant. So if you only ask a point of information, nothing's going to happen with it. So there's a thing that now exists at world schools, which is POI adjustment, uh, where you can get a plus minus, I think, two points max, so half a point, one point, one and a half, or two plus or minus, for points of information adjustment, which basically means the following. If you had a speech that was a 75 and you asked, points of information throughout the debate that were amazing, you can be adjusted for those POIs for, with plus points for your speech. So you would get plus two and have a 77 speech. Or at the same time, if you had an 80 speech but were asking stupid points of information, a judge might dock you down minus two points or minus one point and you would have a 78 or a 79 speech. Now that exists. However, almost no judge uses it, okay? It's been out there for three years and nobody completely understands what it's for, so on and so forth. So don't count on that. And even if you could, that's only two points and you'll never get plus or minus two because I've never seen a judge go over one. For a PO adjustment. Now, what does need to happen then is you need to use your points of information in your speech, right? Because the logic that makes your point of information work only exists in your hand. It's, sorry, in your head, not hand. Um, here's the reason why, right? Even if I ask a point of information like this one, when can national sovereignty be violated? Or even if I wanted to ask a point of information, the ones that we did, the one that we did about Nelson Mandela, which we then didn't use in the speech, which I think was wrong strategically. I'm not sure that you guys knew where we're trying to go with that point of information. Yes, it might have seemed as if we were trying to point that when you're in prison, it's actually better and so on and so forth, which the opposition was trying to abuse preemptively. But at the end of the day, only our use of that point of information in a speech would actually make it impactful. The fact that we didn't use it meant that even that was, even if that was a brilliant question and even if it would completely destroy the opposition's case, that's an extreme example. 
uh, in that if you're going to completely destroy the opposition's case in one point of information, I think the judge will know this. So that won't happen, right? So even if it was a brilliant point of information, it wouldn't have stuck unless I came up in my speech and actually used that point of information. In much the same way I used the points of information that two men really had asked in their own speech. Now, that, what I did there, isn't something that you should try and replicate in your World Tools format because it's specific to British Parliamentary. Okay? Where you need to be all the other teams, not just the other side. And seeing as when you are second government, second opposition is speaking after you, you need to somehow sniff out stuff that they're going to be using, that they're going to be using in the debate, in order to use it against them before they even get to speak. Right? At world schools, when you've got only two teams, one on each side, you don't need to be doing that. Okay? So what I tried to do with those two points of information by two and Ridian, that isn't something that you should strive towards in the world schools. Right? However, you should always use your points of information in your speech. Which show, which drags us to another thing, which is that again, you need to use your points of information strategically. Right? So a point of information is not over when it is answered. That is another very important thing. Okay? A point of information is not over when it's answered. So it isn't enough for you to ask a question and get an answer. You then need to go into your speech and explain to me as a judge why this answer is so important, why this answer shows that, that the other team doesn't have a clue about what they're talking about, why does that answer show whatever it is that it shows? You need to be using points of information in your speech. Otherwise, they'll just fade away and it will be the same as if you guys have never asked your points of information. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Okay. Any, uh, anything else? No. Maybe how do you like someone doing with your stuff? You were talking about to make uh, uh, the debater believe that you messed up in order to them to answer your question. Yeah, I don't think you should make them believe you messed up in a way that you messed up big time. I just think that you should make them believe that the point of information that you're asking is not very strong. Okay, so the problem is the following. Now, points of information are the most direct and the most personal thing that will happen to you in a debate, right? So it is the only moment where someone else points at someone and says, go. So the speaker chooses who is going to attack them. And that only happens at points of information. The speaking order is chosen by other people. So you don't get to choose who speaks before you or after you and who destroys your argument. But you do get to choose the person who asks you a point of information. Right? And in that sense, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening. In that sense, it's very important to recognize the fact that this is one of the few choices about people that debaters make during the debate. Right? And I think that people, for a variety of reasons, are not going to choose you. Right? So either because they're afraid of you, because they think you're too strong of a speaker, either because they think you're boring. Sometimes people aren't going to accept your point because they're simply going to assume that your point that you're going to ask is going to be nonsensical, that it isn't going to make sense, that it's going to only waste their own time. So even stupid people aren't asked points of information. So it isn't a binary choice where people go, oh, I'm going to choose the worst one on the team. That isn't true. I think there's a variety of reasons why people don't choose uh, people to ask points of information. The second thing that I think is very important here is the way this choice is made, and I'll be answering your question very soon, don't worry. Um, the way this choice is made, because this choice isn't a positive choice, okay? So when three people stand up on the other side and ask me about, and ask for a point of information, I'm not going to ask myself, who am I going to choose but the question in essence, or the effective question, is going to be, who am I going to reject? Okay? Because throughout my speech, my instinctual action to a point of information is to say no. So the question at the end of the day, whatever people are asking points of information is, 
who is the one person for whom I'm going to make an exception, right? So the default setting for points of information when they are asked is no, or no thank you, if you're at World Schools and you need to be very nice, okay? Now, when three people stand up, it's still the default no, 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 but the only decision that you make is who is going to be the one person whom you don't reject, and I think that's important to know. Now, there are many different ways in which you can ensure, or at least boost, boost your chances of getting accepted, uh, of getting your point of information accepted, right? Now, if we were going to be doing this, there's a couple of very important things here. Number one, you need to realize that this is a real life activity, okay? So points of information are the moment where reality clashes with the debate. Because the debate itself functions in an ideal world where we are the government or the world police or the whatever we need to be in order to make this discussion a viable discussion. And we are not in a classroom for most of the time. When people are speaking, they're constantly pretending they're someone else. They're constantly pretending that they have many more powers than they actually do. And that's okay, right? It's the only way the debate can function. But when points of information happen, those are the brief moments when you call everyone's attention to the fact that you are now in a classroom arguing about something that you have absolutely no control over, right? And at those moments, all of the real things that are happening around you become important. Now, you are going to be performing as a team. That is very important to know. Because some of the things that I'm going to tell you, you are going to need to handle with your teammates before you can actually actively put it to you. Okay? I don't want you to have that discussion with the other people in your team. So, many things matter when you're asking for points of information. The first thing that matters is, does the speaker see you or not? Okay? If the speaker doesn't see you, they're not going to accept your points of information which means that sometimes you might want to take a step back or a step forward so that you're not hiding behind your other two teammates and that the speaker doesn't see you. Now, the reason that you need to discuss this with your teammates is because some of them in some situations, and I don't know what your team dynamics is, uh, might consider that as being rude, as you're trying to steal their points away from them, right? So you are going to, the rest of the thing that we're going to do, about here need to be discussed with your other team members. But it, in no way the fact that you are now in a team should give you an excuse that you don't consider all these things, right? So number one, if they are unable to see you, they are unable to accept your question. So you need to make sure that you are seen. Some people do that by raising their hands, some people do that by leaning forward, some people do that by taking a couple of, step in a certain, a, of steps in a certain direction. And I think you should figure out what works for you, but you should be aware of the fact that asking points of information is as much a thing of style as it is of everything else, okay? The second thing is how you're going to stand up, okay? You people often get overexcited, and then when you come up with an idea for a point of information, you just go BAM and stand off and the chairs are flying across the room. Nobody's going to accept you in that type of a situation. Okay? Because you've just been a major disruption to their speech. Right? And I, I think it depends on your own style. I am going to make some noise sometimes when I'm going to be debating, but most of the time I'm going to be as quiet as possible. But that is because that suits my own style. Okay? But you need to be aware of the fact that the way you're going to stand up is going to produce effects as far as points of information are concerned. If the whole team is going to stand up, that is going to produce a different effect. Right? So you need to start considering these things, experimenting and playing with them. It makes no sense for me to give you a list of the things I think they work. Because these things only work for me and my own style of debating, which whether or not I'm going to be accepted uh, in a point of information depends on whether people know me, whether they've heard me speak before, whether I've spoken in that debate, and all of these things matter. And that's why I'm just going to show you things that I think you guys should pay attention to the next time you're asking points of information. Now, standing up is one of those things. 
waiting to be accepted is also one of the very important things, right? So people would usually stand up and then stop paying attention, which I think is wrong. I think there's a ton of different ways to be waiting for a point of information, but you need to be aware of the fact that you're waiting for it and you need to be abusing that way to your own favor. So, I don't know, staring dramatically into the speaker's eyes is definitely something that is going to produce effects. I'm not sure if they're effects that you'd like to produce or not, but it is something that's going to change uh, their status. What I like to do when I'm asking points of information is not slightly to people agreeing with the stuff they're saying. I've noticed that that raises my options of being accepted, right? So it shouldn't be a nod in which I'm making fun of them, but it tries to be as genuine of a nod as possible, right? So at that moment, I genuinely try to step out of the debate and agree with what they're saying, and employ like, hmm, yes, absolutely. I would even sometimes, instead of asking a word, uh, asking point of information, so say absolutely to get their attention. Right? So that is something that works for me. You need to figure out if it's going to work for you. Now, the other thing is the stuff that you can say when you're asking points of information, and the rules are pretty strict, right? So the only thing you can say is madam, sir, or point of information. Right? So those are the things that are allowed to you. Now, this is on camera. But here goes nothing. So those rules aren't always enforced, right? There is one thing that you should never do, which is called previewing of your point. So you are not allowed to go and ask on, on Bahrain, madam, right? Because it's already going to force your own content into the speaker's speech, and you're not allowed to do that. And I genuinely think that that is wrong to do in a debate. And you should be avoiding that. However, there are other different ways in which you can drop tiny bits of content, but not content in the sense that you're now going to steer the speech towards a certain things, but content that is going to affect the way the speaker is going to think about themselves and the speaker is going to think about what's going on in their speech. And in that sense, I think points of information can be a powerful weapon, right? So stuff like agreeing with the speaker that I've talked about 30 seconds ago, right? So standing up and saying, yes, instead of standing up and saying point of information, because no judge is ever going to think that you should be penalized for saying yes or absolutely because it wasn't a preview of a point. Right? It's a word that carries essentially the same value as the word question, whereas it does much, much more. Right? It encourages the speaker to keep talking about that. So if they're talking about something that doesn't make sense or doesn't harm your case, sure, stand up and say absolutely and then be rejected and sit down and know that you've actually done something. Okay? Secondly, smile at the speaker. So many of you are so angry at other people when you're debating. Don't do that, okay? People don't like people who frown. Okay? People like people who smile. It's a basic fact of life. There's a hundred different projects and labs who've been working on this and there's tons and tons of scientific research confirming that. So please, Stand up for a point of information, smile, be nice, remember what we've talked about in the beginning. Make the person understand why they are wrong. Right? Don't tell them they're wrong, make them understand and comprehend that they are wrong and what's going on. In order for you to do that, you need to first be nice to those people. You need to smile. Okay? So these are some of the ways that might help you in asking points of information. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, when we were discussing how you should use your points of information in your speech, mm -hmm. um, like obviously you need to do the same for your opposition like speeches as well. How do you utilize their points of information in your speech without getting them have too much waiting in your speech? So, the same way you're going to be using their own arguments in your speech without having them without them carrying too much weight. So in a way, <laughs> so I'm not trying to give you a trick answer that will make you think, but I can see that that's not getting me anywhere, right? So the same way that you would do rebuttal of their own arguments. Right? So if there's an argument that someone makes in their own speech, you come up when you're in your own speech and say they've said blah, 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 which is wrong because of blah, 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 blah. Right? If they ask a point of information, you say they've asked this point of information, but haha, it was a stupid move because they didn't realize this. Right? 
that's how I think you handle points of information from the other side. Anything else? Is there anything that you were hoping you were going to get in this lecture but didn't? No? Then it's one minute till ten and you should all go.